powered flight. Today to the moon and back. Less than 80 years ago, the dream of a select few. Those who combine the vision of their spirit with the practical complexities of engineering. One of these was a New Zealand farmer named Richard Pierce. Alone and unaided, he struggled to make his dream come true. And what he achieved is one of the great untold stories of aviation history. Pierce built an aeroplane. In some ways, the forerunner of these giants and other ways, their descendant. Today, part of the structure of our technological age. Thank you, good understood the principles of the helicopter long before they were designed and flown. His story began again with a modern hang glider, simple and elegant, based on parachute design for returning space capsules. And it is here also that the story of early aviation began again, when the science of moon flight unwittingly spotlighted a forgotten aviation pioneer and his long-ago dreams of flight. Perhaps in March, in the year 1903, his primitive aircraft lumbered uncertainly up from a South Canterbury field and set off down this river. The flight, indeed if it took place, may have lasted only one minute, to be followed by another several weeks later. And the man who designed and constructed that contentious aircraft was born in 1877. Waitoi, in the South Island of New Zealand, a rural backwater in a small British colony. Richard William Pierce. He would grow into a quiet and shy young man, an inventor, a needle threader for his mother, a toy helicopter operated with a pull string. At the age of 21, his father would present him with a small farm. But agricultural pursuits did not interest him. He was fascinated by things mechanical. He wanted to be an engineer, but the expense of such an education was beyond the family means. So Pierce looked upward and dreamed of flight. Today there is strong evidence of that early flight and 18 eyewitness accounts alone of another flight that took place beside his farm. Him towards the cliff. This was the same day though, was it? Yes, the yes. same day. Oh, this all happened within an hour, an hour and a half. And they headed him towards the cliff and he got the engine going, which was a frightening noise. And he got the engine going like fun and the boy started pushing. For to get to get him some speed up and about halfway towards the cliff would that would be or oh, they'd push him about a chain it was going too fast for them for to keep up with it and away he went and we watched him until he turned you saw him in the air we saw him in the air over the cliff turning he turned for to go up the river well then we cut across the paddock diagonally about halfway from where he started to where he landed. We, we could watch from the cliff where he was going. Down on, he was just gradually going down, uh, going downwards. How far from the cliff to where he landed would it have been, do you think? It'd be ending up to half a mile. And here, the mystery really begins. Because Pierce sought no public recognition or finance for development. By nature secretive, 
he sought to protect his ideas before they were made safe by patent. Even making this application meant spelling out what an aircraft was at a time when even the motor car was still a novelty. Not for 60 years were attempts made to reconstruct both aircraft and flight. By then, only rusting fragments remained. With the discovery in 1976 of Pierce's twin-cylinder engine and the blueprints, a reconstruction from these original plans and a restoration of the engine indicated a potential of 24 horsepower. Wind tunnel tests showed the airframe to be aerodynamically stable. It might have flown. And by now his name was linked with controversy because the date of those early flights predated the Wright brothers by nine months. But did this plane actually fly? The locals of South Canterbury, among them people who remembered tales of that early flight, thought so and raised this memorial in 1977. It actually marks the crash landing point of an early Pierce flight. One of them was a great nephew of Pierce, Evan Gardner. And the wheel of history turned full circle with his interest in the very type of aircraft that Pierce would have known the microlite. coming in from the distance. It was almost twin brother to the one above us and it skimmed through the air like a swallow, just as quick and just as graceful. Evan Gardner's farm is one mile from where the first flight took place. Isolation is lessened by modern roads and now the microlite. Just as Piers foresaw, it can be packed away in the corner of a barn while not in use. Light, inexpensive and portable. Able to land anywhere and needing little in the way of storage. A farmer's aerial horse. Even a crop sprayer. would have mocked the capricious muddy roads of Pierce's day and as he so wanted ended the lonely isolation. Richard Pierce was my great uncle. My grandfather, Richard's brother, swung the propeller on that first flight. For my first cross-country flight, I'd planned to drop in and see friends along the way. But the experience I'd looked forward to became one of embarrassment. It was man's original answer to birds of the air. But I sure felt stupid. Not only that, but scared and lonely as well. I can just imagine how Pierce felt, especially as no one then realised the significance of the early experiments.
Piers wanted a plane for the million. Low cost and inexpensive. Almost identical to the modern Microlite. One that would free people from the bondage of wide seas and bad roads. That would take them up like birds into that fascinating free blue sky. The empty open highway of the heavens. He was self-taught, ignorant of all engineering principles, save those learned by hard, practical experience, working entirely on his own. Yet he designed and actually built an aeroplane. This aircraft was the first full-sized and conventionally shaped monoplane in history. It is remarkable in many respects. Piers pioneered the development of ailerons. The triangle undercarriage. The steerable nose wheel. The lightest power to weight engine of its type in the world at the time. He was the only person to have ever designed an engine, designed an airframe, to construct these and teach himself to fly. Further designs and modifications were made. Other planes were built, but never flown. Perhaps the increasing complexity of aerial design overwhelmed him. The mountains of his home. He never saw them from this perspective. And it is only today that we can see the vision behind his thinking. The Microlite. Today's plane for the million is literally a reincarnation of Pierce's concept. For the man himself, another house deeper in the country, there were rumors of another flight attempt. But all around him now, aircraft design was out of the hands of inspired amateurs, and in 1914 received its first great impetus. And with powered flight a reality, Pierce, now aged 37, was still only a farmer and obscure inventor. Here was his chance. Nations were intent on destroying each other, and the new science of aviation went ahead in leaps and bounds. Four short years saw fragile biplanes become sleek engines of death, saw them spread their wings and become four-engine monsters and battleships of the air. But all of this would happen over his head. Pierce remained on the ground, an infantryman, his time at war cut short by illness. Why, when his skills would have been eagerly sought, when he might have applied his keen intellect at the homes of aircraft manufacturing, Vickers, Bristol, Sopwith, perhaps he was then too deep in his personal dreams. Certainly this photo, taken in 1917, is the last known of him, although at the time he still had 30 years to live and another dream to pursue. On returning from the war, Pierce sold up his farm and shifted to suburban Christchurch. There he would build three houses, the rentals of which he would finance another aeroplane. But he was older, his determination and drive becoming obsessive. His last project was in the garage of this small Christchurch home. This photograph snapped by a neighbor before Pierce fenced off his property. Secrecy dominated the project. Problems of patent and design. He worked alone. He finished construction. A bittersweet vindication of his theories and his status in aviation history. Today in the Museum of Transport and Technology, it stands. One man's work and the final flicker of genius revealing Piers not only as a practical engineer, but as a designer. The tilting engine allowed a vertical takeoff. His so-called impractical ideas, such as the drooped leading edges of the wings, are now feasible. In many respects behind his times, in others, uncannily ahead. He called it the utility plane, the people's plane, and even flight testing in his garage and without the wings, it rose three feet off the ground, but like its inventor, it would languish in forgotten isolation and darkness. For Piers, old age and eccentricity, a lonely recluse, who died in 1953, 
in the space age. Even Gardner's own flying has given him a deeper understanding of his ancestor. Pierce bought in bamboo on the handlebars of his bike for the structure of his plane. He used piano wire for the rigging. And although today it's all very different, the spirit and presence of that lonely, misunderstood man still remains in these fields. This was a machine that, like his grandnephew, he could have climbed into. Tinkered with the controls and flown. Materials are different, but the design and construction are similar. Tubular aluminium instead of bamboo, and Dacron replacing calico. No piano wire for struts or drain piping for the engine. There's only one thing in common, bicycle wheels. discovered in government files after his death, hints at the secret of his enigma. Pierce simply wasn't interested in taking aviation into multi-engined majesty or flights higher and higher into the stratosphere. This invention was designed in the first place to solve the problem of the private plane for the million. And in order to do this, it has been adapted to take off or land on any road or field. No private plane can be a success unless it is absolutely independent of aerodromes. The vast network of roads that already exist must serve as takeoff and landing grounds. In order to make these available, very low landing speeds are essential. And the machine was specially designed for this purpose. What do you remember about Richard Pierce as, as a man? You must be very sort of vague memory because you were so young. He was a very quiet man. Very quiet, very... Uh, he was a very quiet man. I can put it no, no better than that. If he came to ask anything, there was no bluster about him. Did he have many friends? Uh, yes, up in the, uh, in the White Tui, yes, he had the, the farmers around were... They thought a lot of Pierce. The family generally, too, presumably. The farmers in general, up around there. Up around Waitui. What did people in the district, can you remember what they, th they thought when he, when he tried to fly? Yes. I can remember that quite well. Uh, because with my mother, you see, they were all very religious. All those people around there were religious. And uh, mother reckoned that if... Uh, if the powers of the god had been that men were supposed to fly, they'd had wings. Well, what did your mother do when she found out you'd, you'd actually seen him fly? Gave us both a patient. Because, because on religious because grounds? On religious grounds, yes. We had no right going there. Because that wasn't meant. 
No man was le uh, nobody was that air belonged to birds, not to the human being. In another time, in another place, his name would rank alongside the Wright brothers. For Pierce, apart from one mad, dizzy moment in 1903, the free blue sky would always be just over his head and just out of reach. The fickle path of history led to obsession and obscurity an old and bitter man, many of whose secrets would die with him. His soaring dream of a plane for the million, venturing no further than the brief moment he was airborne. We had to reach the moon before we could touch the dream of Richard Pierce.